Welcome back everybody to Deep Learning. Thanks for tuning in. Today's topic will be the backpropagation algorithm. So you may be interested in how we actually compute these derivatives in complex neural networks. Recursive self-improvement, um, that is really the pinnacle of that, where you uh, then not only learn uh, how to improve on that problem and on that, but you also improve the way the machine improves and you also improve the way it improves the way it improves itself. And that was my 1987 diploma thesis, which was all about that. Let's look at a simple example. Our true function is 2x1 plus 3x2 to the power of 2 plus 3. Now we want to evaluate the partial derivative of f of x at the position 1, 3 with respect to x1. There are two algorithms that can do that quite efficiently. The first one will be finite differences. The second one is an analytic derivative. So we will go through both examples here. For finite differences, the idea is that you compute the function value at some position x. Then you add a very small increment h to x and evaluate the function there. You also compute the function at f of x and compute the difference between the two. Then you divide by the value of h. So this is actually the definition of a derivative. It is the limit of the difference between f of x plus h and f of x divided by h, in which we let h approach zero. Now the problem is this is not symmetric. So sometimes you want to prefer a symmetric definition instead of computing exactly this at x, we go h over 2 back and h over 2 to the front. This allows us to compute the derivative exactly at the position x. Then we still have to divide over h. This is a symmetric definition. We can do this for our example. So let's try to evaluate this. We take our original definition 2x1 plus 3x2 to the power of 2 plus 3. We wanted to look at the position 1, 3. Let's use the plus h over 2 definition above. Here we set h to a small value, say 2 times 10 to the power of minus 2. We plug it in and you can see that here in this row. Now this is going to be 2 times 1 plus 10 to the minus 2 plus 9 to the power of 2 plus 3. And of course, we also have to subtract our small value in the second term. Then we divide by the small value as well. So we will end up with approximately 124.4404 minus 123.5604 and this will approximately be 43.9999. Now we can compute this for any function even if we don't know the definition of the function. For example, if one has only a software module that we cannot access. In this case, we can use finite differences to approximate the partial derivative. Practically, we can use h in the range of 1 times 10 to the minus 5, which is appropriate for floating point precision. Depending on the precision of your computing system, you can also determine what the appropriate value for h is going to be. You can check that in reference number 7. We see that this is really easy to use. We can evaluate this on any function. We don't need to know the formal definition, but of course, it's computationally inefficient. Imagine you want to determine the gradient, and that is the set of all the partial derivatives of a function that has a dimension of 100. This means that you have to evaluate the function 101 times to compute this entire gradient. 
So this may not be such a great choice for general optimization because it may become inefficient. Of course, it's a cool method in order to check your implementation. Imagine you implemented the analytic version and sometimes you make mistakes. Then you can use this trick to check whether your analytic derivative is correctly implemented. This is also something you will learn in the exercises here. It's really helpful if you want to debug your implementation. Okay, let's talk about analytic gradients. Now the analytic gradient, we can derive it by using a set of analytic differentiation rules. So the first rule is that the derivative of a constant is going to be zero. Then our operator is linear, which means that we can rearrange it if we have, for example, sums of different components. Next, we know the derivatives of monomials. If you have some x to the power of n, the derivative is going to be n times x to the power of n minus 1. The chain rule applies if you have nested functions. It's essentially the key idea that we also need for the backpropagation algorithm. You see that the derivative with respect to x of some nested function is going to be the derivative of the function with respect to g multiplied with the derivative of the function g with respect to x. Okay, so let's place those to the very top right and we need them in the next couple of slides. Let's try to calculate this here and you can see that the partial derivative with respect to x1 of f of x at 1, 3 can be calculated this way. Then we can just plug in the definition. So this is going to be the partial derivative of 2x1 plus 9 to the power of 2. So we can already write the 9 because we can already plug in the 3 and multiply it with 3 to obtain the 9. In the next step, we can essentially compute the partial derivative with respect to the outer function. Now, this is the application of the chain rule and we will introduce this in a new variable set. In the next step, we can then compute the partial derivative of z to the power of 2, where we have to reduce the exponent by 1 and then multiply this with the exponent. So this is going to be 2 times 2x1 plus 9 times the partial derivative of 2x1 plus 9. We can simplify this a bit further. Now you can see if we apply the partial derivative on the 2x1 plus 9, x1 cancels away. Only 2 remains as the constant 9 also vanishes. So in the end, we end up with 2x1 plus 9 times 2. Now if you plug in x1 equals to 1, you will see that our derivative equals to 44. In our numerical implementation that we have evaluated previously, you can see that we had 43.9999. So we were pretty close, but of course, the analytic gradient is more accurate. Now the question is, can we do this automatically? And of course, the answer is yes. We use those rules, the chain rule, linearity, and the other two to decompose complex functions of neural networks. We don't do that manually, but we do it completely automatically in the backpropagation algorithm. This is going to be computationally more efficient than finite differences. So you can easily describe the backpropagation algorithm in a nutshell here. For every neuron, you have to have the inputs x1, x2, and of course the output that is y hat. Then you compute in green the forward pass. You will evaluate somewhere the loss function and then you get the derivative with respect to y hat that comes in in the backward pass. Then for every element in your network graph, you need to know the derivative with respect to the inputs here x1 and x2. What we are missing in this figure are, of course, trainable weights. For trainable weights, we would then also need to compute the derivative with respect to them in order to compute the parameter updates. 
So for every module or node, you need to know the derivative with respect to the inputs and the derivative with respect to the weights. If you have that for every module, then you can compose a graph, and with this graph, you can then compute arbitrary derivatives of very complex functions. Let's go back to our example and apply backpropagation to it. So what do we do? Well, we compute the forward pass first. In order to be able to compute the forward pass, we plug in the intermediate definitions. So we decompose this now into a that is 2 times x1 and b that is 3 times x2. Then we compute those and we get the values 2 and 9 for a and b. This allows us to compute c that is the sum of the two. This equates to 11. Then we can compute e from that that is nothing else than 2 to the power of c. This gives us 121. Now we finally compute g, that is e plus 3, so in the end we end up with 124. Now we need to backpropagate. So we need to compute the partial derivatives. Here the partial derivatives of g with respect to e is going to be 1. Then we compute the partial derivative of e with respect to c, and you're going to see that is 2c. With c being 11, this evaluates to 22. Then we need a partial derivative of c with respect to a, which is again 1. Now we need the partial derivative of a with respect to x1. If you look at this block, then you can see that this partial derivative is going to be 2. So we have now to multiply all of the partial derivatives from the right to the left in order to get the result 1 times 22 times 1 times 2 and this is going to be 44. So this was the backpropagation algorithm applied to our example. Stuff that works best is really simple. Now we do have a kind of stability problem. We multiply with potentially high and low numbers quite frequently in the scope of backpropagation. This then gives us the problem of positive feedback and this can cause disaster. An example of positive feedback and how it can lead to disaster is shown in this small video here. Dawn of a fatal day and the wind begins to speak with a roar that no man can fail to hear. In a 40 mile an hour gale, the center span weaves like a ribbon in a swinging twist that you wouldn't believe possible unless you could see it as you do now. There's an automobile caught on the heaving roadway. The 11,000 ton center span twists and strains the giant cables that support it. Cables of 6,300 wire strands, each 17 inches thick. Back out of the danger zone, all stricken spectators are driven to safety as the bridge gyrates like a nightmare high above the river, twisting, turning, curling. The lone motorist is forced to abandon the car. He has but a few minutes in which to save himself. Face to face with fate, his destiny hanging in the balance. Will he heed the last warning or perish with the doomed structure? But he saved himself by seconds. No structure of steel and concrete can stand such a strain. Steel girders buckle and giant cables snap like puny threads. 
There it goes. Engineers are divided as to the cause of the disaster. Some claim it was the use of solid girders. Others differ. But whatever the reason, Tacoma will rebuild. This time a bridge that will not provide a super thrill in the news. Now what can we do about it? This is essentially a feedback loop. We have this controller and the output where we can compute the gradient. You see that there is this value of eta. Now if we have eta too high, we will create positive feedback. This then will result in very high values of our updates and then our loss may grow or really explode. So if it is too large, we may even have an increase in the loss function, although we seek to minimize it. What can also happen is if you pick either too small, then you end up with the blue curve. This is called the vanishing gradient, where we just have two small steps and we don't get a good convergence. So there is no reduction of loss. It's also called the vanishing gradient problem. So only if you choose either appropriately, you will get a good learning rate. With a good learning rate, the loss should start decreasing very quickly over many iterations following this green curve. We should then get into some kind of convergence and when we have no changes anymore, we are essentially at the point of convergence on the training data set. We can then stop updating our weights so we see the choice of EDA is critical for our learning and only if you set it appropriately you will get a good training process. So let's sum up backpropagation. It's built around the chain rule. It uses a forward pass. Once we are at the end and evaluate our loss function, essentially the difference to our learning target, then we can backpropagate. These computations are very efficient using a dynamic programming approach. Backpropagation is not a training algorithm. It is just a way of computing a gradient. You will see the actual training programs when we discuss loss and optimization in one of the next lectures. Some very important consequences are we have a product of partials, which means that the numerical error is multiplied. This can be very problematic. Also because of the product of partials, we then result either in vanishing or exploding gradients. So when you have very low values, close to zero and you start multiplying them with each other, then you have an exponential decay causing vanishing gradients. If you have very high numbers, of course, you can also very quickly end up in exponential growth, the exploding gradients. We see gradients are crucial for our training. So let's talk a bit about activation functions and their derivatives. One of the classical ones is the sine function. We already had that in the perceptron. Now you can see that it is symmetric and normalized between 1 and minus 1. But remember, we are talking about partial derivatives in order to compute the weight updates. So the derivative of this function is a bit problematic because it's zero everywhere except at the point zero and there you essentially have infinity as value. So it's not so great to use it in combination with gradient descent. So what have people been doing? They switched to different functions. And a popular one is the sigmoid function. So it's an S-shaped function that scales everything between 0 and 1, using a negative exponential function in the denominator. The nice thing is that if you compute the derivative of this, it is essentially f of x times 1 minus f of x. So at least the derivative can be computed quite efficiently. In the forward pass, you always have to deal with the exponential functions, which is also kind of problematic. Also, if you look at this function between, let's say, minus 3 and 3, you get gradients that may be suited for backpropagation. As soon as you go farther away from minus 3 or 3, 
you see that the derivative of this function will be very close to zero. So we have saturation and again if you expect that you have a couple of those sigmoid functions behind each other, then it's quite likely that it will produce very low values. This can also lead to vanishing gradients. So what did people do to beat that? Well, they introduced a piecewise linear activation function called the rectified linear unit, RELU, which is the maximum of zero and x. So everything that is below zero is clipped to zero and everything else is just kept. Now this is nice because we can compute this very efficiently. There's no exponential function involved. The derivative is simply one if x was greater than zero and zero everywhere else. So there's much less vanishing gradient as essentially the entire positive half space can be used for gradient descent. There are also some problems with the RELU, which we will look in more detail when we talk about activation functions. Okay, now you understood many basic concepts of the backpropagation algorithm, but we still have to talk about more complex situations and in particular layers. So right now we did everything on neural node level. If you want to do the backpropagation on neural level, it's very hard and you will very quickly lose oversight. So we will introduce layer abstraction and see how we can compute those gradients for entire layers in the next lecture. So I hope you liked this video as well and looking forward to meeting you in the next one. Thank you very much and bye bye.